The Kef Blade 2 Meta Speaker is by far the best speaker that I personally have ever heard. Doesn't mean that it's the best speaker that you've ever heard, but it means it's the best speaker that I've ever heard, and I've heard a lot. Objectively speaking, it's also one of, if the not best, measuring speakers in every regard. Like, as a whole, take off every single objective metric, and it's at the top or the top for each individual objective measurement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with some of the intro stuff. I'm going to talk about the basic design functions. I'm going to talk about the subjective experience, you know, listening to these speakers, and then I'm going to end it with the objective. If you don't care about my subjective, then I'm going to have this video timestamped. You can go ahead and skip to the objective. If you don't care about objective, just watch the subjective. Either way, I'm going to talk about both of those aspects because it's what I want to do and it's what I consider part of the process, honestly. So let's start off with the design. This is about 57 inches tall. There is a larger brother to this, which is the Blade 1 Meta. Now the Blade 2 Meta has four six and a half inch mid-base drivers that flank a coincident coaxial driver that features the mid-range and the tweeter. The larger version, the Blade 1 Meta that I'm not reviewing, is kind of the same. It's bigger, and it features, I think, 9.5-inch mid-bass drivers. This speaker is also rear-ported, so it features one port about midway up in the back, and then another port toward the bottom, and you can buy amp it if you want to. These speakers retail for about $30,000 a pair. It's $28,995, I think is what's listed on their website. I'm sure if you go to your local dealer, you can probably get a better deal, but you're talking somewhere in that ballpark for these speakers. They come in all sorts of colors, and I'm gonna show you a few here on their website. We've got this blue, we've got this satin gray, which personally, that's the color I like the most. A gloss black, a gloss red, a satin blue with a blue cone, and then all sorts of other ones. This gloss black right here, and then this gloss black with the gold cone. You can get these, in pretty much any color that you want, just you order them custom and that's it. And I don't think it costs you anything extra to do that. The ones that I were sent, as you can see, are black gloss with a silver cone. You'll also notice that these speakers are very smooth. There's no box edge to them at all. And that's done on purpose because it eliminates diffraction. And diffraction is when you have a sharp edge and a sound wave goes out to that sharp edge, hits that sharp edge and comes back at you, the listener, then it comes back at you out of phase. And usually what happens is anywhere between like, let's say four kilohertz to eight kilohertz, you're gonna get a dip in response on axis. But as you go to the side of that speaker and go off axis, that dip will start to fill in. And that means that the direct sound to the reflected sound is gonna have a little bit of a difference. And whether or not that's inaudible or audible is gonna be more dependent upon how wide that dip is on axis and the amplitude of it. So in some cases, I felt like I could probably hear it. In other cases, I thought, man, that's that's not an issue at all. But with this particular speaker, because it's so rounded, there is no sharp edge, there is no diffraction issue. So as you go off axis to on axis, the only thing that changes is just the overall amplitude. It just starts to roll off. And that's what you wanna see. A good speaker will do that. I've played around with many great speakers that still have that issue. It doesn't mean they can't sound good, but a speaker like this, having that kind of curvature to the baffle, it's not just an aesthetic, it is an actual engineering principle. If you're wondering why there are mid-bass drivers around the concentric driver, like why is this speaker designed the way that it is? Well, think about it like this. Pretty much every sound engineer that you talk to universally will tell you that the ideal speaker is a true point source. Now, what is a point source? A point source will be a speaker that covers 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz from just one single location. That way, all the sounds are radiating out in the same fashion, but that's not really easy to do. And the easiest way to get there would be to have a coaxial driver. And there are some that are three-way. So it's a mid-bass, mid-range, and high-frequency coincident driver all in one. But Every one of those that I've come across has pretty significant issues in maintaining the radiation profile as it hands off from one driver to the next. And even simple two-way designs, I find that there are a lot that don't do it very well. And in fact, KEF, in my opinion, pretty much leads the charge there. There are others who do a good job, 
uh, MoFi does a good job and Genelec also do a good job. But personally speaking, I feel like Kef's engineering, as far as coaxial designs go, have come a really long way toward perfecting the handoff as you go from mid-range to tweeter. Going back to the idea of a point source, when you have one central location for the sound to be generated from, then when you're reproducing sounds, that is the ideal. The more you separate drivers out, the more opportunity you have for failure. And I'm not saying that two-way designs and three-way designs with multiple speakers are bad. I'm just saying that the crossover becomes more involved. The handoff from the mid-range to the tweeter or the mid-bass to the mid-range to the tweeter, that is more complex. And to get a good vertical radiation pattern is pretty dang tough. There's not many out there, even three-way designs, that do well beyond about plus or minus 30 degrees vertically. That is where Kef's designs really separate themselves from other speakers. Now, the drawback to that potentially is modulated distortion. The mid-range in a coaxial design acts as a waveguide for that tweeter. And a waveguide basically is, just think of like your horn speakers, right? You've got a compression driver way at the throat of this weird shape, and this weird shape is actually designed to disperse the sound in a pretty even fashion, at least if it's a good design. That's really what this coaxial driver is doing, and the mid-range is the waveguide. Now, as that waveguide is moving and those high-frequency sounds are playing, there is the potential for modulation to occur. But when you have the mid-range crossed over relatively high, which in this case I believe is at about 550 hertz, that movement of that mid-range is extremely minimal, and the likelihood of you hearing any sort of modulated distortion, honestly, I'd say is pretty much zero. And anybody who tells you that they hear modulation from this particular speaker at least, I would seriously question that and ask them to prove it, because I'm not sure that I buy it at all. Maybe a speaker where it's playing full range and you know it's trying to play 50 hertz while it's also playing two kilohertz out of the tweeter, a lot of movement on that cone, potential for modulated distortion. I could see that. But a speaker like this where they minimize the motion of that mid-range via the crossover, I don't really buy that you could hear that modulation distortion. So in my mind, the fact that they've taken these six and a half inch woofers, they've flanked it around this coaxial mid-range design, and they basically made this thing a true point source, to me is probably the best possible speaker design that you could have. And I'm saying that up front because I want you to understand that there are certainly sided biases that could influence what I hear in my listening test. And that's why I always have the data. So if you want to go check out the data to see if anything I'm saying makes sense or doesn't make sense, you've got that. It'll be on my website, aaronsaudiocorner.com, and I'll show a lot of it here in this video. So now talking about the subjective. One of the tracks that I was listening to that I caught something was Why Not Me by The Judge. And there's this box sound. It's like somebody's tapping a box. Now, I've heard it in every other song before, but what stood out to me about this particular set of speakers when I was listening to this song is that that box sound was very, very deep in the sound stage, but it also created a lot of ambiance around it. When I was listening to Michael Jackson's Wanna Be Starting Something, I'm just listening to it like I normally do, and I hear it, and I've not heard that before. Yes, audiophile tropes. I've never heard that sound before. Listen. I'm sure I've heard that sound before, but I've never heard it as distinctly as I did with these speakers, to the point where I spent about 45 minutes watching a guy break down the stems from all of these, all the stems, which are the individual channel mixes for this song, until I could figure out where it was. And it's called a percussive scratch, and it lasts just a couple seconds, and it starts at around, hold on, around 29 seconds or so. If you're listening for that, it sounds like a kind of sound, and that's the best I can really do it, but it only shows up a couple times early in that track, and you probably will hear it every set of speakers that I went back to listen to after I listened to that on the blades, I heard that sound, but every single time, it never sounded as distinct as it did with the blades, even like the PS FR10, the PS Audio FR10s, it didn't sound as distinct. Even listening through headphones, it didn't sound as distinct. You can hear it, it's there, but it doesn't have the same distinction that it did with the blades. It was just, it was off over here by himself with this much room separating, you know, physical space 
in the sound stage. That could change depending on where you are and things like that. But that's what I heard. And that really caught my attention. Another track I like is Walk of Life by Dire Straits. So I listen to the whole Brothers in Arms album because it's one of my favorites. I like to just sit and let the uh, let the world just kind of wash over me and, and weight off of my shoulders and that whole thing. So that's what I did. And I got to Walk of Life. And at the beginning of Walk of Life, there's a, a hi-hat, like a little cymbal tap, right? And, it, and it's consistent through that song, I believe. Memory serves. But years ago, what I learned was that that tap isn't the same one repeated over it. It actually not only sounds different, but it shifts around in the stage a little bit. So I use that as a test track to see if I notice a difference in A, the timbre of that, and B, the distinction of where the placement is in the sound stage. And I feel like I noticed that to a higher level than I did with any other speakers before. Certainly this could be recency bias, but again, I was flip-flopping between PS Audio, I had the MoFi Source Point 8 still on hand. I actually had the Neumann KH80s like right next to me, and I sat those up in the near field and listened to those as well. No speakers that I listened to did what the blades do. Now, outside of that, just my general commentary is that, oh my God, these are the best speakers I've ever heard, without a doubt. I've already been asked, well, what do you think about the KEF LS60 wireless speakers compared to these? And at first glance, the LS60 wireless speakers look like they're a miniature blade. They don't sound anything like the Blade 2 Meta. I mean, it's not even close. What about the Reference 1 Meta with a subwoofer? Maybe. The Reference 1 Meta is a fantastic bookshelf speaker. They're about 9000 bucks a pair. I reviewed them a couple years ago. I loved them. But if I'm going by cognitive memory, which is typically a bad thing to go by, I got to tell you that nothing I've listened to can come close to sounding as good as the Blade 2 Metas, at least as I've heard them in my living room. I mean, I am honestly floored. And I really do think that I will try to buy them, if not soon, at some point. I This is the question that I've asked myself many times is, how does it get better than this? Like I've heard other speakers and at the time I thought, well, how does it get better than this? But I know that it's possible. But now that I'm at this speaker, I'm thinking, how does it get better? So the ways that I think it could be improved is, one, if they could extend down to 20 hertz with real authority, there's six and a half inch woofers, there's four of them. They get down to 30 hertz without an issue. Anechoically, I think they get down to around 30 hertz. So output really isn't a problem, but once they get to that, they start to roll off pretty quickly. The other thing that I would like to see, and this is just a personal thing, is if you've watched my videos before, you know that I've talked about, I like a wide radiation sound. With the PS Audio FR10 that I just reviewed, they're about plus or minus 70 degrees, plus or minus 80 degrees. So take the front half of the speaker and do like that, plus or minus 70, 80 degrees, something like that, right? And then you do like that, it's 140 to 160. I like having that really wide sound from a speaker, horizontally speaking. And with the Blade 2s, it is more narrow. It's, it's noticeably more narrow, but it's not so much a detriment that I wouldn't consider buying them. And the way that I kind of got around that was instead of pointing them directly at me, I actually towed them out by about 20 degrees or so, somewhere in that ballpark, maybe 10 to 20 degrees. And, and it's in that region somewhere. In doing so, what that did was that opened up the reflections off the sidewall. So there was more reflections off the sidewall. It gave it a bit more spaciousness, but I didn't lose a thing in terms of image stability. So as you hear sounds within the soundstage, there was no issue with that. There were still very precise focus to instruments and objects within the soundstage. Another neat thing about the speaker is the vertical radiation. Because it's a coaxial driver, it has a really nice wide vertical radiation response. And it pretty much matches the exact same way as it does horizontally. So what I'm saying is that instead of the sound being wide horizontally, but narrow vertically, like most two-way, three-way speakers where they're stacked drivers, these particular speakers pretty much have the same horizontal and vertical radiation pattern where it's about plus or minus 50 degrees horizontally, plus or minus 50 degrees vertically. Now that works out for you if you like to move around. If you're going to set these up somewhere in a living room that might be attached to a kitchen, which is the same situation that I'm about to move into. And that's one reason why I like a coaxial design for my personal living space, living space and listening space. 
So to wrap up my subjective portion, again, I just want to repeat that this is my opinion based on sighted listening, based on the years of aspiration to be able to hear these speakers in my own room. But they are the best speaker I've ever heard, without a doubt, to me. And the data that you're about to see, I think, will give you some confidence in me saying that. So with that said, let's talk about the data. The data that you're about to see is all captured using my Clipple near field scanner. And I got to tell you guys, I didn't think that I was going to be able to measure this thing on my Clipple. I, I thought I was going to be too tall. And in fact, it's about this much from touching the ceiling where I'm testing this. Now, I test these speakers in my own house, actually. I no longer test in the garage, which may change in the future. But for right now, they're in my house. Getting the speaker, I think it's 70 to 80 pounds. So it's not that it's so much heavy. It's that it's a $15,000 speaker on its own, $30,000 a pair. Getting it onto the four and a half foot tall platform was the most butt puckering situation I've been in since I was a teenager and I was running from the law. And I'm not kidding. Starting off with the impedance, uh, minimum impedance is about 3.3 ohm. Minimum EPDR is about 1.8 ohm. I imagine that if you're paying $30,000 for a pair of speakers, you're probably not powering it with an AVR. So I don't really have to tell you that you'll want a separate power amplifier for this speaker. Frequency response on axis and listening window. Look at this deviation window right here. Within about two and a half decibels. I mean, holy cow. Now there is a little bit of a resonance at around 200 hertz. I did see this in Kef's white paper as well. It makes me think that yes, indeed it is a cabinet issue or something like that. But I gotta tell you, this is probably the only bad thing in this data that you're going to see. F3, 31 Hertz, F10 at 26 Hertz. So like I said earlier, when it starts rolling off at around 30 Hertz, it rolls off pretty quickly. 2034 data set, good Lord, look at the directivity index. Look how good this is. I don't even have to say anything. That's just, Oh my gosh. Okay, next. Estimated in-room response at on axis, 10 degrees and 30 degrees. And for those of you who don't know what I mean, on axis is this black pointed directly at the listener. And then 30 degrees is in red pointed directly basically into the room. Now with most coaxial speakers, usually you wanna be about 10 to 20 degrees off axis from the speaker because there is gonna be a diffraction dip due to the symmetry of the either the box, so the edge of the box that I talked about earlier, diffraction from the edge of the box, or there can be diffraction from the mid-range and tweeter housing. There'll be a little bit of an issue there. This speaker doesn't really have those as issues. However, as I said earlier, I did find that towing these speakers out by about 20 degrees resulted in a better overall soundstage width for me while not sacrificing imaging quality. So what I've done here is I've kind of drawn a line and if you listen to these speakers directly on axis, it is possible that they may sound a little bit elevated in the treble, a little bit. But if you tow them out 10 to 30 degrees, just however you want, really, you can bring that down some and increase the spatial qualities of these speakers. Horizontal response. I'm saying it's about plus or minus 50 degrees at the negative 6 dB point. So this shadow of red right through here, that's kind of where it tops out at. And then vertical, you can see almost matches it exactly. In fact, vertical, it looks a little bit better. Now I'm calling out 50 degrees here, but depending on where you put this point, you could say it's 60 degrees if you wanted to. Either way you go, the vertical and the horizontal dispersion of this speaker is fantastic. It maintains its composure and its directivity excellently. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels. I mean, this is ridiculously low. This is like noise floor of the room low. 96 decibels, again, ridiculously low especially through the mid-range. Now you can see that you're starting to increase below about 100 Hertz. And this must be the tuning frequency because it drops back down. This is where the port takes over, I assume. And then it increases above that. Are you gonna hear this distortion? I'd be really surprised if you did. Multitone distortion to me is probably the best way to tell what the distortion is gonna be like in terms of audibility. Now, it does depend on the level that you're listening to, which I'm showing in my data but also the content and the frequency that you're hearing that distortion at. You might hear distortion better at one frequency versus another, and your content may do a better job of exposing certain qualities about distortion of a speaker that maybe another song wouldn't. Having said all that, the data for this speaker looks, again, incredible. So I test at 70 decibels, 78, 87, and then 96. And 96 would be this 8.9 volts right here. You're below 1% even with multi-tone distortion. 
Now you go higher in frequency, you do start increasing the multi-tone distortion, but it's still below my personal 3% threshold. Compression sweeps from 76 to 102 decibels at one meter show excellent dynamic range out of this speaker, as you can see here. This rivals the best compression sweeps that I've seen of any of my tests so far, including the Reference One Meta, as well as the JBL 4367. The other compression testing that I do is done at the same time as my multi-tone distortion testing. And it includes those same levels of 70, 78, 87, 96 decibels, 30 seconds of multi-tone distortion at those output levels, and then I capture the compression. That's what you see here. Even at full tilt, 96 decibels at one meter for 30 seconds, there's less than half a decibel of compression at worst. And then when you get down here, this is to me is probably just more or less in the noise of the measurement itself. And that's it for the data. As I said earlier, if I step through each one of these, they're individually one of, if not the best metrics of measurements that I've seen for any speakers thus far. As well they should be, $29,000, $30,000 speakers, it better measure well, but it does. So not only does it look nice, not only does it have a lot of engineering behind it, but it pays off in an objectively, exceptionally well-measured speaker. And that does it for my review here. I hope you appreciate it. If you have any comments, please leave them in the comment section below. If you have the time, please like, and if you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing to this channel. If you'd like to support me and what I do, you can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. I post a lot of different stuff behind the scenes. Uh, I'll leak out some information about what's coming next, do polls, share photos, and it's just a good community to be part of, and I would certainly appreciate your assistance there. Alternatively, if you're shopping from Amazon, Crutchfield, Best Buy, whatever, I have generic affiliate links in my description below. Click on one of those, buy whatever you need, and I do earn a small commission off that, which helps me keep this channel running. Am I gonna buy the speaker? I'm damn well gonna try. I don't know that I can swing it right now, but to me, this is the pinnacle of where I wanna be in terms of sound quality, and I'm gonna try. So with that said, I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.